Okay, hope everyone had a nice coffee break. So now we're gonna talk about NAMD. This is obviously an introduction to NAMD. Um, so first you wanna know NAMD has been under development for 20 years. This uh, started as a small grad student project in Klaus's lab and it's come all the way to being used in every major petascale supercomputer in the US. Um, the, uh, the main citation for NAMD, or the current citation for NAMD, is uh, Philips et al. and JCC. Um, I know you're probably familiar with this simulation, the catering and folding, that this was done by Marcos Sotomayor, who is now faculty at uh, Ohio State University. Uh, this is uh, our virus capsid, which was performed by, I, I performed these simulations. Um, so what are the key, what are key about NAMD is uh, you can accelerate your simulations by the use of GPUs. It, it scale, I mean, it's the program that scales the best out of any other MD code. We can scale to hundreds of thousands of cores. Uh, we can use the entire Blue Waters machine. We can use the entire Titan machine, and we're still in the uh, pretty good scaling um, regime. Um, NAMD has multiple features that make it very attractive for experimentalists. It can integrate experimental data, as uh, I showed before. Something that is of interest is uh, cryo-EM, but you can also incorporate uh, NMR restraints. You can also incorporate, um, you can also simulate, uh, similar to like a atomic force microscopy experiments. You can perform free energy calculations. You can, uh, it supports multiple copy algorithms. For instance, like replica exchange, uh, we, we do a constant pH by using replica exchange simulations. We also perform, you can do um, um, transition path sampling or like a transition state theory to study conformational change between known states of a protein using multi-copy algorithms like the uh, string method and um, a swarm of trajectories and all those kind of multi-copy algorithms. And we can also, um, NAMD also supports up, up to a couple million, I mean, several million. I mean, we, we know it can run up to two billion atoms, but the largest simulations performed to date go all the way to 250 million atoms. So those are the capabilities of NAMD, but that obviously doesn't come free. It requires lots of algorithm development. Um, there has been, oh, from 1995 to 2014, over 50 papers just in developing methods so NAMD can support these new technologies. We were the first pe people to adopt uh, GPUs on uh, MD codes before anyone else was doing GPU computing, we were doing it. Um, we are now, in for an, a good example of what it takes to develop uh, a software like NAMD is now the, 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 the shift from particle mesh AWALT we're shifting to multi-level summation, which doesn't require periodic boundary conditions, and it also doesn't have the, the, the scaling limitations that a particle mesh AWOL has. And this was the, the details of this, uh, if anyone is interested in how method development works, you can, I invite you to read uh, the, the, pap the paper by David, who is one of our research programmers in the group, on multi-level summation and how the electrostatics are gonna be computed in the, in the future. Obviously, um, we, we support pretty well petascale supercomputers, but we're also looking into the future. There is an initiative by the White House to go to exascale by 2022, and that requires the development of new algorithms, and one of those is obviously getting better electrostatics that are not limited by the, um, the FFT step that is part of uh, PME, particle mesh AWOL. And uh, part of that effort, for, I mean, an example of that effort going, going from our side is the the use of the multi-level summation method. So if you're interested, I mean, it's obviously more theoretical than applied, but just to give an idea of what it takes to get the program as much as NAMD, how, many, how much effort it is. So I know people love folding or don't. <laughs> but uh, okay, so this is uh, a simulation that was published in 2018. As far, uh, you, you can, you can, this is NAMD, right? I don't think this was, this was before Anton, because this was a very, sm a falling of a very small, 
uh, this is 26 amino acids. I think this was actually before Anton came into production. Um, we showed the, I show you guys this before in the, in the VMD uh, session. So you can simulate proteins, and we know we can, sell, we can fold proteins, but the real question is what do you learn? And what we like to think, or what we know we learn, is we, le we learn the atomic level details of folding dynamics. And it goes along the question that you asked before, is like, can you fold a protein with a coarse grain model? The answer is yes, you can. But you, are compl you, you don't have this atomic picture information, right? You don't know what is actually leading towards this folded state. Um, this was done by, uh, like the, the person who started all this in the group was Peter Fredolino, who is now a professor at the University of Michigan. And what are, what are the key steps? What do we learn here? So, I mean, again, this is a six. This was a then long simulation, not long by any standards today. It's a six microsecond long simulation of the folding of the headpiece. Again, this, this starting the starting state. I don't think we have a movie there. We have a movie for this one. Starting starting step. I mean, you you guys have from, uh, should be familiar with this picture by now. So you start with a completely unfolded state, and then as the simulation progresses, it 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 it, uh, it, it converts to its folded state. So you can see the formation of the helix here. But what do you learn? It's like you find these key folding intermediates. Right, I mean, you, you, you don't, what you're actually finding is, like what we learned from, from, what the community learned from this simulation is like there are some key intermediate steps that need to happen for the actual fault state to be reached. And that's something, this uh, atomic picture, this picture is something that can only be accomplished with all atom simulations. So let's look at what a coarse grain simulation can provide. So we also, I mean, we also do coarse grain and NAMD fully supports coarse grain models. It supports the Martini force field. It supports um, shape-based coarse grain models. Like, I think I'm going to talk about them later. But if not, I think I am. If not today, tomorrow. Um, so this is using a force field that was developed in the lab. It's called the PACE force field. It's, um, it's an improvement over the Martini force field for amino acids. And what we're looking at here, this was done with, uh, with by uh, one of our postdocs, Wei Han. He's now a professor in China. Um, <clears throat> this was published in JAX in 2014. Is the growth of the beta amyloid fibril. And here, in this case, we're not only looking at the folding of a, of a, of a protein, we're actually looking at how the, the, uh, the fibril is formed. And if you, I'm going to replay the movie so you guys can look at it. So you can see it comes uh, like a unfolded, and what, like, like after like uh, this was like 1.3 millisecond of, uh, see, of of sampling, and what we can see is like how like the 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 the, 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 the fibril is getting is growing is like you have these two ends, like you have the minus tip and you have the plus tip, and how it has a preference to grow from the plus tip, and you can see how it organizes and makes this. Uh, Nicely, like this stacking of, uh, of of fibrils, and that this is a, a very interesting picture of how this fibril grows. So this is not protein folding. This is uh, goes a little bit beyond that. You can actually look at this how how this process grows. What is interesting, uh, the pace force field is a, is a coarse grain force field, but it's what is called um, a united atom force field, which means you remove a few hydrogens, but it's not as coarse grain as shape very coarse. Uh, uh, shaped base coarse grain, but you still have a c uh, amino acid and you still have a few particles that represent the, uh, the, the properties. You still have electrostatics, but you can reach mu much longer time scales, like 1.3 milliseconds in this case. Oh, yes? At some point this week, will there be a discussion of force fields and what's the all? I mean, if the. Oh, I'll Yeah, so I'll explain a little bit more about force fields tomorrow. Not in a lot of detail, but my, as you say, yeah, as you mentioned, there is a lot of force fields out there. Um, so I mean, um, yeah, yeah. So there, I mean, the problem with um, 
particularly coarse grain force fields is they work for some problems but not for others. They're not really transferable and sometimes they require reparameterization which is a, f um, a feature of these, uh, for instance, uh, United Atom models. Um, uh, the more general force fields, like all atom force fields, they also have their caveats, um, but they're more general. You know, they, they tend to work for more problems. Um, it, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're probably not going to get into a discussion of which force field to use in what situation, but uh, maybe it will become more clear when later. Yeah, maybe we can have a discussion. If someone is interested, we can have a small group discussion, exchange some ideas. Yeah. So <clears throat> I show you guys before the unfolding by pulling, like this is star MD simulation. And um, well, the, 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 the natural question is why would you want to pull a protein like that, right? So well, there are, there, uh, for AFM experiments, where like, um, does anyone here do AFM? Like stretching protein, you do? I don't, someone in the lab is working on Well, okay, so basically, is popular, uh, everyone familiar with how AFM works? Or I'll explain it. So essentially, you just have a substrate, and you have this cantilever, and then you attach. Um, you 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 essentially bind the cantilever to the tip of the protein, and then you just stretch, as we're looking here in the in the movie. <coughs> so you can effectively unfold the protein in this way. But then you can also obtain very interesting physical measurements of, of or, or learn a lot about the physical properties of, of, the, of the protein. So the, the, the first, uh, some of the first, uh, first experiment on uh, AFM experiment of, of breaking apart a protein was done in 1997. And um, it was a science paper back then. And what they have is this, uh, what is pretty common in that field is this extension versus force. So you have, so you're effectively, you have the cantilever, you're measuring for how, you're measuring how, you're pulling the cantilever and then you're measuring how much force the protein exerts. And what people first observed was this, the appearance of this first peak, or the rupture peak. And well, obviously no one knows what, what that rupture peaks mean. So uh, I think this was also done by Marcus, if I'm not mistaken. No, this was done by Barry, a different, it was before Marcus. So we start like asking, okay, so okay, we have the we fix this end here, and then we start pulling on the other end, and then we have the same thing. We have we're looking at the extension in the simulation. Well, this now this is a simulation, so it provides an atomic picture of what may be happening in the AFM experiment. So you have the extension and the force. You can actually measure how much force are you applying to for to obtain a particular extension. So if you notice, like. The, we, we perform this simulation at something at constant velocity. So that's, uh, that's, that, that's, the, that's how these simulations are performed. They're, you're, you're essentially pulling at a constant velocity. And then that, because it, it's constant velocity, you, you have the, the, what the, what's changing is the force you're applying, right? So back then, in 1997, you were measuring a, a particular, so someone measured a rupture, rupture force for a particular velocity. And that's, uh, we're, we're having here some uh, particular velocity here. So let's keep going. So this simulation was 1998, and it shows the first peak. If you notice, there is a huge discrepancy between the force in the simulation and the force in the experiment, like a couple of orders of magnitude. So you might ask, why is that happening? Well, the reason is because we're pulling really, really fast here. Right, because we're limited by the, the, the length of the simulation. So we're pulling really, really fast. So, but we're really pulling really, really slow in the, in the AFM experiment. So what, what can we learn? What can we do? OK, so let's keep pulling. We have the shape is very, like the overall shape of the uh, force versus extension curve is pretty similar, right? That resembles it pretty well. So that was the simulation done in 1998. This is where simulations were in 1998. This is where experiments were in 1997. And what happened? So where simulations had been getting better and better, right? So like 2000, we were here. 2009, we were here. So we're getting slower and slower, 
right? We're getting better sampling, we're being able to pull slower and slower. And what we're observing is the force that we're measuring is going down, right? And similarly, the experimental setup is getting better, so they can pull faster, right? So now we're starting to get to the same regimes. We're starting, we're starting to overlap. And what's more interesting is that this rupture force to velocity was predicted by Hummer and Savo. It's called the Hummer and Savo model. And if you look at all the experimental data and the, the simulation data that we've been doing over the past 20 years now, right? So you can see that we actually fit the Hummer and Savo model pretty well. So this is a very nice uh, example of uh, so like how the experiments, where the experiments were in 1997, where the simulations were in 1998, and how we like collectively have been converging to like actually being studying the, the same processes and converging to, the, to measuring the same, the same things. And what is interesting is like we agreed with the experiment. So what did we, what did we discover, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's nice to match the experiments. It's nice that we, we matched the Hummer and Savo model, and then we were, some, we were like actually studying regions far to the right of the Hummer and Savo model. But what do we learn? The answer is pretty simple. It's actually, we actually revealed the unfolding process in atomic detail back in the day. This was 1997. And if, and if you notice what this simulation is pr showing here, is like the hydrogen bonds are being shown in purple, and the force is being exerted perpendicular to the hydrogen bond. So what the simulation is showing is that the force peak at H bond breaking in sure mode. So effectively, the force is completely perpendicular to the hydrogen bond, and then that's when you get the peak, and that's when you get when you start breaking this particular strand, which is completely perpendicular to the um, to the force being applied. That's when you start getting the peak. And there were like some confirmations that Klaus published later um, in 1999 that uh, showed that this, this model was true. Um, also, something that is very important is, and is also very, some, um, that we kind of give for granted in our group is all our simulations are in explicit solvent. And also that what was shown here was that the water actually mediates the, and participate in the H bond breaking. So you need water to, you need water to come in and facilitate the breaking of the hydrogen bond. So it's not only the protein that is involved in the breaking of the hydrogen bonds, also water plays a role. So that's a, that's a, an, a, that's a very, very, very detailed picture of a very, a very detailed picture that actually not only involves the protein, but also involves the, the, the solvent. Can you answer a question from this region as well? From here? So why is this uh, only 50 nanometers and this is 300 nanometers? So this is the old experiment. Um, the, hmm, that's actually a good question. Yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. This is nanometers, this is Armstrong, uh -huh. different units. Yeah, this is, this is actually 10 times, this is 30 nanometers here. So we sh should be roughly the same, yeah. Yeah, because it's completely extended. So right, you essentially have a, a rope, and you're just pulling the rope. It's like just pulling the the covalent bonds in the background. So I know in some cases it's said that it makes like some proteins won't pull correctly in simulation, and this might have to do sometimes how well the hydrogen bond is represented. I, I didn't know. I mean, whether you guys have ever made any available any failed simulations where like a protein doesn't pull. So, so we, we in general we don't really believe in structural de structural determination by protein folding. Mm. I, we, I, we think that's inherently invalid because um, you're gonna have folding refolding events. Right. Okay. So unless you have like a, a extremely long simulation and you can actually prove that you're in a free energy basing and a complete like a global minima, you won't be able to call that your structure. 
So a structural determination by protein folding, I don't think is. Well, I Yeah, so the problem is like you're going to be limited by the force field, and the force field cannot really fold all the proteins. Or, right, right, right. or if you have some ion, like uh, calcium is not particularly well behaved ion in, um, in simulations. So if you have calcium, for instance, um, you're guaranteed you're not going to get the, the, the right fold. Okay. So, I mean, there are some. It's, it's not commonly accepted that you can predict structure by folding proteins. Mm -hmm. So you're actually studying folding, refolding, or some other. You're actually you're, that's what you're studying when you're doing these folding uh, simulations. Is folding, refolding, not really structural prediction. Well, okay, that's right. Yeah, you're not studying. Uh huh. So uh, when you apply the force, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a complete non-equilibrium sampling. It's quasi-equilibrium sampling. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So. So, so what is the point of convergence, right? Because each time it moves, you can you still may have different force. Right? Yeah. Um, so let's look at that. Actually, that's actually in the next slide. So, so you're right. So like every time you make one of these uh, force versus extension profiles, every time you run a simulation, you're going to get a different profile. And that's also true for AFM. So you 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 don't always get like a, that's an old study, but nowadays even if you do multiple uh, pooling experiments, you're going to get different uh, force versus uh, extension profiles. So it's known that you don't you, you don't get the same one, but you get a probability of multiple. You get a, if you perform it as you're saying multiple times the simulation, you 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 get to observe more common force profiles than others. So you, yeah, this is, you have to run it multiple times. But um, you're out, yeah, you're out of equilibrium. You're not, you're near equilibrium, but you're out of equilibrium. And this is actually, this was done by Jen Singh, who's now at Google. Is like we were showing the f before. Is a single. Oh, I missed it. We were looking looking before at a single of these domains of titan. But now we're going to be looking not at one, but how it is more scientific, more uh, biologically relevant is where you have a series of them, and when you start actually pulling to a series of them, and again is the same force profile, force versus extension, and you can see. I don't know how the, how good the shadow is. Uh, can you guys see the shadow? Yes, right. So that's actually what, what the, the simulation shows is, is the, uh, the shadow. And what the theory predicts, at least for the bending of these, is that the, the, the cyan can align. But then if you compute a moving average, you, you, you get to pretty much reproduce the, the theoretical prediction. Theory. This is a homer sabo theory. So, and then it goes again to what you were saying. This is the quasi equilibrium principle is that all degrees of freedom that are not constrained by forces are in equilibrium. So, I mean, you, you, you're effectively pulling, but every single of these, uh, every single uh, repeat is in, in near equilibrium as long as it is uh, the degrees of freedom are perpendicular to the force. Um, let's look at. Another example of SMD, and this is related to the gut bacteria in the in the uh, in the, the gut bacteria in the in cows. In this case, uh, this work has been done by uh, one of our colleagues or postdocs in the group, Rafael Bernardi. So the idea is that the the these uh, studies can be applied to bioenergy. Of biofuel production. So effectively, the, bacteria, the, the, the interaction that he has been studying is the, how coesine and docrine dock together. And this is 
one of the strongest non-covalent bonds in, in nature. And the quest big question is how does this bond work? How is how, what makes this so so strong? And actually, I don't know the affinity, but I we do know the 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 rupture force is non-covalent. Non-covalent. Yeah. Sorry about that. And what is interesting is that uh, the rupture force versus the loading rate. You can see the, the simulation is up here. We only have a data point right now. But you can, the experiment predicts that as you load, as the load increases, the rupture for also increases, which is uh, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? So like uh, if you have a stronger force, so it's like if you have a stronger force, then you require a uh, stronger load, it requires more force to break it. And so by doing the, ex the computational experiment, what, what, we were uh, what Raphael was able to observe was that if you notice, uh, he is now pulling. If you notice, it becomes the contact between the two subunits becomes larger. So the contact area here between, so the contact area between cohesin and dockering as he pulls. So as he pulls, the, the contact area between the two proteins becomes larger. And as such, the, hydro, the, hydrophobicity, the hydrophobic effect increases, right? So like what is happening is as you pull, you increase the, the contact area. And as it, it, because you increase the contact area, the, 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 the interaction between the two proteins become, become larger. It's kind of like um, they made the analogy, uh, these uh, little toys that you put your fingers and you try to pull and you get trapped. But that, this was a very interesting observation. And, um, it's very, uh, I mean, this is also shows what you can do with, with the simulations is you cannot really see this otherwise, right? Like the, the only way you can look at this is if you actually perform the simulation and the only, because of, is very like, if you look at this, is, these are side chains. It's like the only way you can actually look at this is like if the, you have every atom in the system, if you include a, an atom, a, the atomic detailed picture of, of the system. So this was published, yeah, Nature Communications, uh, 2014. So if you guys are more interested in, in looking at this study. Um, so that's more on, uh, on these uh, pulling experiments. I want to see if anyone has any questions up to here. I have a question uh -huh. about the simulation the uh -huh. That's, I didn't do it. Uh, that was Jin Singh. Um, So you're talking about the ti the Titan repeats. Yeah. It's published 2011, no, 28, 2008. That's probably very fast. That's probably, um, I'm guessing, probably you got nanometer per nanosecond, something like that. Okay. But I'm guessing it should be in the details in the, in the manuscript. Right now we're well below that. I don't know how much. I was the pulling speed with Raphael's experiments. But he, I mean, his are, were much slower. And obviously, I mean, as I showed before, there is a dependence on velocity, how, how fast you pull, right? But I think, um, I actually don't remember the details. I think he, he, rule, he checked different for different velocities. But also like, so that's this, like the strongest molecular force, and then but this one is a, a much softer spring. You can also like study, use. Uh, this is was actually done by Marcus. Is anchoring repeats, and these are actually uh, here is uh, he was able to predict the spring constant for these anchoring repeats to be. That's what he predicted five millinewtons per meter, and then they measure it a year after, and it turned out to be, oh, ballpark. Um, this was uh, 340,000 atoms, which by 2005 standards, that was pretty big. Uh, it was 20 nanoseconds. Yeah, this was, that was uh, quite an achievement. And I, it's very interesting how, well, the simulation came before, it was published and structured, then they actually measured it by AFM experiments, published that in Nature. But, um, it's uh, 
it also shows you that you, I mean, it's another ex uh, example of what can be accomplished with, with the simulations. You, I mean, you can study the strongest forces, you can study the softest for forces. One might ask, where are the simulations going? I mean, in, in reality, we, we, when, when you look at the number of, like the size of the simulations versus time, what, how, how, how big they're becoming. So if you go and look at what was being done in the 90s, it was like a lysozyme, right? It was a very small uh, system, and it was actually, you know, it wasn't even so, it did have waters. But um, the fossils are also evolving, of course. But I mean, as, you, as we go in time, we went through aquaporin, which was a big achievement at the beginning of the 2000s. They went a lot of work on the ATP synthetase. This was a breakthrough done in, the, in Klaus's lab, the STMV simulation. That was one of the largest simulations for the longest time only until the ribosome came up. The ribosome is about 3 million atoms. Then we did the HIV capsid, which was 64 million atoms, and now we're working on the uh, photosynthetic chromatophore, which is 100 million atoms. So you can see there is a trend to go to larger and larger systems. And we expect it, I mean, we know we're going to system, I mean, th there is, we know there is a 250 million influenza variant that is being uh, simulated for a couple nanoseconds now. So, so we, 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 we know this is going to um, larger and larger sizes. But us also getting there. I mean, so there are uh, there are uh, algorithmic de developments, so you can sample uh, longer time scales, not by direct observation, but you can also do like I mean, you've done one before, so like, you can if you have a reaction coordinate, you can yeah, actually kind of yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that that's the thing is like um, so like if you have a replica exchange. You can do replica exchange on these big systems, and we have done them. And uh, so it's not only like straight MD, you also, you also not canonical MD, you also get all these uh, enhanced versions in, of MD, also get a boost every time we, we there, there is a, I mean, you get it size, but you also get all these enhanced MD simulations capabilities coming with it. So, but time scale, I mean, there is, you're, I mean, there is the Anton II machine. It supports uh, fairly big systems, right? Um, so I think, yeah, it's just moving to getting longer time scales and bigger, <laughs> lar larger, larger size systems. So this was the work done on aquaporin back in 2002. These were Emmatar Koshit, who is a professor at UIUC, and Martin Jensen, who is now at DU Show. This was very, it was a breakthrough back in the day because it was, a compl it was an aquaporin. You can see the, the lipids are simplified, yeah, but they uh, are simplified for, the, for, for this movie, but they're actually in the simulation. And what you can actually see is this very nice translocation of water to, through the, the pore. If you follow this water here, for instance, you can see how it is diffusing. And what is more interesting is you have that rotation of the water. If you notice it was facing up and then it's facing down, and it's that flip of the water which regulates. So if you see it comes facing in, like the little V, and it comes down like an N. So that turning of the water was like what, uh, what Klaus and, uh, and Matt published in Science in 2002, and that was the regulation step of what, that's the filter that prevents, that makes this, um, makes water diffuse 10 times slower than if it was just like a pure pour. So you have this uh, reorientation of water inside, going inside of, um, of aquaporin. Obviously, like uh, there was a crystal for aquaporin, but this mechanism wouldn't have been possible to observe if not because of the simulations. <clears throat> so then again, that was back in the day, so. So we've, we've gone a long, long way from there. So we're doing, this is uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Bo Liu and JC Gumbert have work, been working on this for quite some time, is how antibi antibiotics uh, affect the ribosome. So there is a lot going on in this figure. Obviously everyone is known with uh, antibiotics are becoming less and less effective because the, the bacteria are developing resistance. 
So it's important to understand how antibiotics work at a molecular level. And this has been, uh, uh, I mean, they published a lot of papers with uh, Mankist, Mankin and Wilson. And um, this is a very, it's a big endeavor because it involves going from an electron microscope, electron microscope of densities. If you notice, there's a little density in, in this figure. That's the electron microscope. It also involves, it's a very, it's a very, um, it's a big endeavor because it requires uh, getting an atomic picture, first deriving an atomic model from the ribosome, then obtaining the parameters for the erythromycin or the, or the antibiotic that you are interested in. So this is where the force field toolkit become, comes in handy. And then you have to also create, you can also create these models. Um, this is, I think he might have done some network analysis in this paper, but I could be wrong. I don't really remember. But um, this is also another example of, um, but they're probably, they published probably like five or six papers in the past couple of years. So it's a big, a big area of research in the group. Um, in any case, this also shows what you can do with molecular dynamics, what you can do with NAMD. is like you can study and how antibiotics interact with the ribosome. Obviously here you also have the extra complexity of having um, the, the, um, the RNA, and I think you have a, I think this is a growing, I think it's a growing chain, so you probably have a, like a, a little piece of like um, that uh, protein that is being synthesized. In any case, that's a, another example of what you can, what you can accomplish with, with NAMD. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about my own research. And let's start here. So this one I can tell you more because this is what I actually do. So I work on the HIV capsid. So the HIV capsid, these are micrograms, uh, tomograms of were done by John Briggs in 2006. When you look at an HIV variant, what you can observe is this uh, envelope in blue. You can observe some something in yellow. But you have this, always you observe this conical core or capsid, which is all red, and it's always conical. So here's an artistic representation of, of a variant. You have the glycoproteins, and then inside you have the capsid. So if you just look, we focus on the capsid, what we can observe is that the capsid is made of these hexamers and pentamers. So the capsid contains 186 hexamers, 12 pentamers, and each of the pentamers, if you notice, is what induces these uh, sharp declinations and help the capsid come and become a, a closed surface. So we start by tackling the, the, the hexamers of hexamers, and this is also obviously how simulations help you. Is like, if you notice, you have, um, you have seven of these hexamers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And here is a, like a electron microscopy data. So this is low resolution, well, high resolution. Uh, cryo EM, this was eight Armstrong, so you can actually see the little helices here. Those are this sort of like secondary structural helices. You can see the dimer here, like you can see these, these um, hexagons are being held together by dimers. So what we did is we, we built a hybrid model, which was then you, using the molecular dynamics flexible fitting, you can see the helices are put into place, and then you can find the interactions inside the lattice. So if you know, like everything that is like kind of a ghost, that's the EM density, that's the resolution, that's eight Armstrong resolution, so that's all you get. But by combining the EM and the all atom simulations, you can actually create this uh, extended lattice which contains hexamers and how the hexamers are held together. And obviously this, this right now this is only a tube, but also like uh, we, we're having this nice curvature, so we're actually generating an, uh, uh, a model of seven hexamers in a tubular arrangement which is similar to what we'll be, we'll be seeing in the, in, the, in, the, in the body of the capsid. So something else we did is, and this is something you can do, is 
this is kind of a glimpse into self-assembly of a virus because you have a central pentamer and you can see how the dimers here, I'm, I'm highlighting the dimers, you, you can see how they start closing. So this was a 1.5 microsecond simulation, 1.3 million atoms. This was done in 2012. Um, but th th this way we can, we can study the interactions between uh, pentamers and the surrounding hexamers. And this was obviously like you're, you're combining the, the data guided molecular dynamics now with a, this is completely uh, a canonical MD uh, com uh, running freely on, on a supercomputer. Let's skip this. So this is also something that we can, we can generate with the radar modeling. So this cone, we believe it is a filarenic cone. So we, we actually found a way to generate multiple um, of these scaffolds. I'm just showing here how, how we generate the scaffolds. We use uh, some algorithm. I'm not going to go into detail. But effectively, we go from a, or a series of uh, location of the pentagons into a scaffold of, of a, a closed filarenic model. And you can see what is, uh, you have seven pentamers in one end, and then you have five pentamers on the other end. We do some uh, uh, little refinement then. So we can then like do some, uh, so this is something we use uh, again BMD for, and is you have this experimental density, right? And then you, we, we, we generated all these models, so you can now actually calculate a cross correlation uh, between the, the models and the experimental density to see which of the models actually fits better to the density. So you can rank them by, um, you can rank them by the cross correlation to the density and that way you can pick a, a scaffold. Um, if anyone's interested, we published that in Nature in 2013. And then using the, the, the supercomputer, we're actually able to just not have a, a scaffold. We actually have a, um, a complete atomic model where, I mean, you can see the hexamers and you can see the pentamers. And the, the interesting thing here is that these simulations contain, this simulation contains um, not only every atom in, in, the, in, the, in the capsid, but also contains the solvent and the ions, which are important, play an important role in, for the stability of the system. Uh, these simulations had been running on Blue Waters, the National Science Foundation Blue Waters, and uh, the Titan supercomputer in Oak Ridge. And here you can have like a closer look at it. So it's not like a, it's not just a pretty picture. It actually contains a lot of information of how the the, the atoms are put together into this uh, into this capsid model. We actually have extended these simulations to uh, over one microsecond, so we have 64 million atoms, one microsecond simulation, which is, uh, as far as I know, is the benchmark in, in the field. Um, but again, we can look at atomic level details. We can, again, these things are moving. It's not a static picture. And we can see, for instance, these uh, blue balls are chloride. And we can see how chloride is translocating through the central center of the pores, which is, this is also very interesting to look at, uh, having the ability to look at how the solvent plays a role and how the solvent may be involved in some biological process uh, later on. Um, I'm gonna skip, stop that there. Let me see. Do I, uh, does anyone have any questions about that yet? Nope. Okay. Let me tell you about some other work we've done here. Probably multi okay, so here's how infection works in the capsid. So uh, the infection by HIV or most lentiviruses is, a, is a, a rather complicated process because it involves cooperation by the cell. So this is, this is the exterior of the cell, this is the cytoplasm, and then this is the nucleus of the cell. So actually for a, for a successful HIV infection, you actually have to go all the way from the exterior to the cell to the nuclei, which means you actually need to cope, like you need the cooperation of the cell for successful infection. And what we know now is that the capsid plays an important role and regulates many of these interactions. 
So a lot of uh, hosts, um, a lot of cells are immune by inducing premature encoding, which effectively, with, which means that the capsid is disassembled, disassembled or broken apart before you actually reach the nuclei and be able to infect. And something that we proved and we published this this year is that uh, cycle, like the way that cyclophilling interacts with the with the capsid affects this. But I'm going to tell you about a drug that we've been working on with, which is called PF74. PF74 was a drug that was discovered by Pfizer. And this, the way this drug works is actually unknown, but there are some hypotheses. So if you notice, this, uh, we have infection on the y-axis. We have a concentration of the drug on the x-axis. And you can see that this, uh, well, these are two, this is HIV-1 here in, in in the solid dots and simian immunodeficiency virus in, uh, in gray. And you can see how when you start applying the, the, the drug, the, the infect infectivity goes down. So we want to see how PF74 works, and we want to see if we can do that computationally. So, but we don't, I mean, this is a good example where we don't have the, the parameters, right? So what, what do we do? So this is the chemical structure of PF74. So what we did is something which is called a fragmentation approach. So we effectively break the phenylalanine groups. We parameterize those apart from the uh, phenyl group here. So then this is how the parameterization works. We calculate the, we calculate the charges, partial charges for every atom in, in, in the molecule. We calculate the, 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 the bonds constants. We will we'll go into more detail of how these bonds are defined. We calculate like the angles, the dihedrals, we, 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 we do the dihedral scan and all these things that uh, allow us to fit a QM model into the um, classical force field. So we, and that way we effectively have the parameters that we can incorporate in our simulation. And this was all done using the force field toolkit in, in VMD. Yes? Again. This was all done using the FFTK, the, the force field toolkit in VMD. It take, I mean, do the, the only caveat is that you need a Gaussian to do this calculation. So if you have a Gaussian license, which is, I think it's, ex I don't, I think it's expensive as far as I know. But uh, as long as you have the license, you, you should be able to parameterize uh, relatively easily. Well, that's an overstatement, but yeah, easier than before. So, so now, the question is, what, what does it do in the capsid, right? So we have our capsid model. So there are a couple of crystals. We're not interested in the docking part because there are crystals that show where it docks, but the crystal don't answer the question of what's going on. So you can see here, this is a, a, a simulation. It's a pentamer surrounded by hexamers. You can see here PF74. And this is like the, the results of the molecular dynamics. And as expected, there, is no, there are no structural changes, which is what really puzzles everyone. Is like the binding of the drug doesn't really affect the, doesn't affect the, the, the structure of the protein. But what we found is that it actually affects the dynamics. And that's where, again, the simulations are so revealing and show us so much information. So PF74 binds, so this is, this is a two domain protein. And PF74, this is the binding pocket. And here we're showing this coloring scale is showing the root mean square fluctuations. So if things are very rigid, they're white. If they're very mobile, they're red or hot, right? If they're yellow, they're kind of not so hot. So the first thing that we can learn is that the, the, the rigidity of the binding pocket is much higher, right? So this is in the absence of PF74. This is in the presence of PF74. So PF74 is, is making that, that pocket a lot more rigid. But then this is when we combine the simulations with the network analysis. So again, uh, I'm, if, you're, if you're interested in looking at the network analysis, there is a tutorial. So what we, we, we're looking here is what is the effect of the drug on allosteric pathways in the protein? So here is not, the drug is absent, here is the drug. And here we're mapping the allosteric pathway connecting this region, which we know it's important for assembly, with a, another binding loop that we know it's important for infectivity. And what we can see is that this is the, the wild type 
allosteric pathway. And then we can see when the drug is bound that allosteric pathway is altered. So this is a dynamic property and so it's something we extract directly from the simulations. So this is a nice example of how you can combine like large scale simulations with force field development with, a, a, with a, this network analysis that is um, to get a interest, I mean, to get biologically relevant answers. And this, th we published this work in a, a f journal of physical chemistry letters this year, came, came out very, I think it came out last year, uh, I'm sorry, last month. Those simulations were five microseconds. It, no, this is no drug. So we have the simulation, the control without the drug, and we have the, the simulation with the drug. Mm -hmm. But we sample over five microseconds. So it doesn't take five microseconds. It takes the drug to bind to make it more rigid. Oh, so five yes. Uh -huh. Yes? I guess I'm The tool chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Well, you need you need some extra programs like Gaussian, but um, the, the for instance the the FFTK oh, will will give you the configuration files that you need to run Gaussian. So you just need to get a Gaussian license, which is expensive. What um, Everything else is NAMD VMD. Network analysis is NAMD VMD. It's VMD, uh, in fact. So there is, uh, I don't know if you have more specific questions. Um, well, but you must have some set of scripts or something, right? Well, yeah, for my, for my specific problem, I have a way I build the model and right. things like this. And you do that like a TCL? Or TCL, yes, yeah. As a matter of fact, um, well, Yi we will give a, a demo. We're trying to get um, more, because right, like right now everyone has, there is the question of reproducibility, right? Like because there is a lot of uh, homebrew TCL scripts that never make it to the manuscripts, right? <laughs> <laughs> so for instance, um, we, we published a paper on eLife last year, and eLife has a very nice policy that they allow you to upload all the TCL scripts. Right, so that's cool. But that also has a drawback in the sense that TCL is an evolving language, and then in 10 years' time, like, we don't even know if TCL is going to be there. So, so right. Um, but that's a different discussion. Um, but we have this um, QuickMD, which um, he's going to show, which um, spits more, uh, generates more standard scripts. Uh, so you can just, uh, if you want to share your script with someone else, it's like you just send them the scripts and they run. Like right now, if I send you my scripts, you're gonna have a hard time. I mean, you'll get it to work, but it will take some time. Um, the, yeah, but the, the, I think the core, which is NAMD and VMD, is, is still the most critical parts of the tool chain. Sorry, um, can, can you repeat the question? I think you said that you yeah, we broke it in, in three parts. And you did that presumably because it's a rather large molecule. Yes, yes. So when do you start well, two well, here is, I mean, this is kind of a simple molecule because it's, if you look at it, it's essentially a backbone with, two, with three side chains. So you, you, you can, you, you, okay, so here, there are two things going on. You have that the simplicity of the molecule going on for you, so that that per, you don't have to calculate, for instance, any of the other parts of the ring because you assume they're not going to change from what other people have done. Um, if the molecule is too <coughs> extremely big, you definitely want to fragment, uh, break it into fragments, because the Gaussian you, would, you just won't converge. You won't get a you won't get an answer. Um, it's problem dependent, um, yeah. But yeah, we here we this is, this one is relatively simple molecule, so.
Yeah, parameterization is a very, it's a big deal, yeah. And it's more of an art than a science. Yeah. Yes? Is there a follow up workshop on how to do that? Uh, well, you should probably write that on the evaluation form. I, I, I think there's enough interest. And, yeah. And, um, yeah, we'll touch base tomorrow more on like polar, polarizable force fields because, I mean, if um, something that might have been overlooked and we're going to get back to it tomorrow is uh, these are point like charges and atoms are nothing like point like charges, right? That you have electronic polarizability. And these force fields completely lack any information on that. This kind of works into a question I had. Um, so I'm trying to run QMMM simulations on a calcium binding system. <coughs> and I'm using Amber because it has a really neat uh, interface to execute mm -hmm. quantum programs. And or in, uh, one, uh, it has like a function clock method built into mm -hmm. it. Are there any plans to implement this in memory? So yes, we have, uh, we have a demo right now. Uh, use, it, it works with a Mopac. And Orca, so you can actually do QMM MM on NAMD. Uh, where the paper, this is Raphael who's doing this. Um, the paper is being written. I know there is a demo, so I mean, I guess the release should be. It's forthcoming. It's forthcoming. Yeah, it's in our plans. It should come. I don't know. I don't want to say soon because I don't know when it's coming. But <laughs> yes. For the parameterization. Not right now, so that's another, so. And why? So there are some intrinsic cases that I don't know because I don't develop FFTK, but the, the way I think is mostly related to the way that the waters are optimized. There, there is, a, it's probably, it's, I mean, you know, there, we only have one person developing FFTK. The, it's in the queue to, um, to, to use games and yeah, yeah. It, it yes so games is in the queue it will come at some point yes it is in the queue is we have one developer working on this so yeah. mm -hmm. so I guess uh, I'll let you present the demo on QuickMD this is the latest of our plugins.